Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. Lewis? Uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, why is America not the greatest the country in the world, Professor? That's my answer. You're saying yes. You're, tell students that America is so star-spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom. Canada has freedom. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. <laughs> so, 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. All right. And yet you, a uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is, there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? now own more wealth than do the bottom 30% of the American people. One family owns more wealth than the bottom 30%, 90 million Americans. Today, the top 1% own 40% of all of the wealth in America. Top 1% own 40% of all the wealth in all of human history, mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. And no matter where you go, politics is a matter of, of social engagement. And most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world, and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, lack of respect, exploitation. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. So we have to do what we do best. We have to lead. We have to lead. We have to update the global rules of the road. We have to, we have to do it in a way that maximizes benefits for everyone. Because obviously it's overwhelmingly in our interest. This is not a zero-sum game. It's overwhelmingly in our interest that China prosper, that Mongolia prosper, that nations big and large, East and West, in Latin America and in Africa prosper. Because, you know that old expression, they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, he said that's where the money is. We want everybody to have a little money. The Orwell famously said that he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. And that is because of the vital role that history plays in deciding our interpretation of what is happening in the world. The US National Archives censored all searches to the word WikiLeaks. Following that revelation, we looked closely to what else was going on. And in fact, uh, as Kristen said, from 2006, uh, it became apparent that the U.S. National Archive had reverse classification of over 55,000 uh, pages of material that a great analysis done by the National Security Archives, a, a group run out of George Washington University. Imagine for a moment that somewhere in the middle of Texas there was a large foreign military base, say Chinese or Russian. Imagine that thousands of armed foreign troops were constantly patrolling American streets in military vehicles. Imagine they were here under the auspices of keeping us safe or promoting democracy or protecting their strategic interests. 
Imagine that they operated outside of U.S. law and that the Constitution did not apply to them. Imagine that every now and then they made mistakes or acted on bad information and accidentally killed or terrorized innocent Americans, including women and children, most of the time with little or no repercussions or consequences. Imagine that they set up checkpoints on our soil and routinely searched and ransacked entire neighborhoods of homes. Imagine if Americans were fearful of these foreign troops and overwhelmingly thought America would be better off without their presence. Imagine if some Americans were so angry about them being in Texas that they actually joined together to fight them off in defense of our soil and sovereignty because leadership and government refused or were unable to do so. Imagine that those Americans were labeled terrorists or insurgents for their defensive actions and routinely killed or captured or tortured by the foreign troops on our land. Imagine that the occupiers' attitude was that if they just killed enough Americans, the resistance would stop. But instead, for every American killed, ten more would take up arms against them, resulting in perpetual bloodshed. Imagine if most of the citizens of the foreign land also wanted these troops to return home. Imagine if they elected a leader who promised to bring them home and put an end to this horror. Imagine if that leader changed his mind once he took office. The reality is that our military presence on foreign soil is as offensive to the people that live there as armed Chinese troops would be if they were stationed in Texas. Texas. Shutting down military bases and ceasing to deal with other nations with threats and violence is not isolationism. It is the opposite. Opening ourselves up to friendship, honest trade, and diplomacy is the foreign policy of peace and prosperity. It is the only foreign policy that will not bankrupt us in the short order, as our current actions most definitely will. I share the disappointment of the American people in the foreign policy rhetoric coming from the administration. The sad thing is, our foreign policy will change eventually, as Rome's did, when all budgetary and monetary tricks to fund it are exhausted.